Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and this is Ascension Presents. So I'm making this video um, in response to the scandal in Pennsylvania um, about uh, 300 priests who abused thousand or thousands um, of children. Um, people were asking me, there's like, Father Mike, when are you gonna, why, when are you gonna comment on this? When are you gonna make a statement about this? When are you gonna uh, talk about this? When, you can, when, when are you going to condemn it? Um, and I just thought that was, uh, I was like, well, Part of me was asking, well, what do you mean? When it's obviously condemnable, right? It's, it's obviously evil. Why would I need to, in some, and just go with me on this. Just please be patient with me on this. I'm kind of like, why would I need to condemn it? Because it's obviously like the worst thing ever. It's just like, it's beyond, okay, I'll get to that in a second. Um, well, because you need to speak out. I'm like, well, it's easy to speak out against evil when evil's obvious, right? So right now, there's no argument. There's no argument that that's like, Literally, for me, it's the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life. It's the worst thing I've ever heard in my entire life. It's, it is beyond comprehension. Honestly, in my mind, comprehension, I don't understand it. Uh, it's beyond my imagination. Like, I've seen Law & Order, SVU, and I've seen, like, you okay, gave terrible things that people have done in, like, depicted in, in the, that TV show. I could never imagine in my entire life what I heard about um, priests doing to these kids, never ever. And so they're like, Father, like, speak against this. I'm like, it's, if I were to speak against it now, I would be merely virtue signaling. That's all this, all the, that's all this video would be. I mean, virtue signaling, what's virtue signaling? Virtue signaling is um, putting on the appearance of like, hey, I'm on this side. Uh, when it comes to the evil thing, like I'm against the evil thing. And that's obvious. But see, the, the problem with, there's a difference between virtue and virtue signaling. Virtue signaling is I get to claim to be on the right side and condemn something that's obviously evil at no cost to myself. I don't actually need virtue in order to condemn the evil. Virtue signaling. Because I can make a video like this and we can post things on Twitter and we can post things on Facebook and say like, this is so terrible. And it is obviously, right? But it doesn't cost me anything. That's not virtue. That's virtue signaling. The real virtue are the people who worked on the grand jury for the last however long, two years and went through all that garbage to find out and prosecute and, and get to the truth, to get to the bottom of things, that's virtue. That's real virtue. That costs them something. Uh, the, the actual virtue has to do with those, those good priests and good bishops who are willing to say, actually, no, no more. Someone needs to speak out about this. That's real virtue. And the real, the biggest thing of the virtue is those victims who, when the statute of limitations in Pennsylvania was lifted, after years of the shame they experienced, after years of what they had to go through, when they had the chance to speak, those kids, now grown, those, those victims spoke. That, that, that's virtue. Making a video is virtue signaling. Standing up when no one else is standing up. Right now everyone's standing up. This video could be just another voice. But when those people who were hurt, when they stood up, that's virtue. And that's so important. So, like, well, so then if that's the case, then what I'm making the video, if all it is is virtue signaling, is because um, one of the things I ask people is like, well, why, why would you, I don't know, again, I'm just apologizing for this, but like, why would you need me? Like, I'm just some priest in Minnesota. Why would you need me to say something about this? And one of the things that kept coming back was, well, we just want to know that you priests are as angry and upset about this as we are. And I can't tell you how that just like struck me because I'm like, I just assumed that you assumed that I would be, right? I just assumed that you assumed that all priests and all bishops would be like, what the, you know, just like, I mean, I realized the gap, right? Between the gap of trust. That's between um, a lot of people and the church when they have to be told that, oh, the horror you experience when you heard some of these stories is the horror that your priest and your bishop feels. But if that's the question, then here's the answer. As I said earlier, I had never imagined and I could never <sighs> fathom the level of pain these kids went through and, and this turning a blind eye that had happened in the church for years. 
This like will shuffle you around, and I know there's a bunch of there's a bunch of reasons that you know. Well, maybe they thought this and this and this at the time. I don't care. I don't care. What I'm talking about right now is a willingness to compromise and a will, an unwillingness to be courageous when it comes to when it came to brother priests, when it came to bishops. It's terrible. But here's something I want to also say. Because the next thing of people who are saying is like, well, we just want you to know that you're as angry as us. I'm like, I can't convey to you how angry I am. The next thing they asked was, um, well, do you, did you know about all this stuff? Like you as a priest, you like, I mean, you know, the thing with Archbishop McCarrick, like this whole kind of like this, this grooming of, you know, homosexual predatory behavior happening in seminaries and then in the hierarchy or in the, you know, dioceses and stuff. Did you like, do you guys all know all about all those things? And I have to say, I didn't. When it came to this abuse stuff, did, did you know? Do you have any sense? And I just have to tell you, I think for the most part, I'm just a normal priest, right? Like I'm an average priest in my diocese doing my stuff. Had no idea. When it came to like the, again, this kind of like this stuff in seminary that just, I read about when it came to the story of Archbishop McCarrick. People asked me, is that what seminary is like? I'm like, no. In fact, when I went to seminary, I, before I went there, I read a book that my mom had given me called Goodbye Good Men by Michael S. Rose. And it was all about exposing like just the corruption and terrible stuff in, in American seminaries in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so I got there in 1997, uh, 1998. Um, and I was, so I was on alert, like, yeah, I read a book that said all about some of the garbage and stuff that's happening there. Um, and I didn't, it wasn't on my radar. Why? Because I think the seminaries had been cleaned up enough by then. In fact, I remember talking with a priest after I was ordained. He became the rector of St. John Vianney Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. Father Bill Bear, he just died recently. May he rest in peace. Good man. He was the kind of character of the person that you'd say, hmm, because of guys like him, those who would likely to abuse would never get past his, his door. They would never get past his gate. In fact, I remember him sharing this with me, with me that he'd have guys that they would say, okay, this behavior was evil, inappropriate. It lent, lent itself towards possibly, like he'd be a person who would, would disordered sexuality basically. And these guys would be crying in his office, keep me in here. And he said, I'd rather have you cry in my office than in years, some mom and dad cry in my office because I let you out. I said you were fine to pass through formation, pass through seminary, and be ordained. He said, I'd rather have you cry here than anyone be hurt by you and see them have to cry. And then it's my fault. Because that's the kind of, that's the kind of priests I know. You guys, just so you know, the kind of priests that I've encountered are not these who abuse. And, not, and the kind of bishops I've encountered are not those who compromise. In fact, I have, uh, our bishop here up in Duluth is awesome. His name is Father, uh, Bishop Paul Serba. And Bishop Paul, he, he's, he's so gentle, right? He's so kind. If you ever met him, he's just like, oh my gosh, this man is so kind. He's so gentle. But I describe him as like a, a carpeted wall. What I mean by that is because you go up to him like, oh, he's soft, he's gentle, he's kind. You push against it it's like, oh my gosh, this guy does not compromise. When it comes to like any kind of abuse stuff that would, would come across his desk, he's a man who would be kind. He does not compromise in any way, shape, or form. When it comes to protection of youth, when it comes to protection of anyone, here's a man who has an iron will. Same thing with Archbishop Hebda, the other bishop I know down in St. Paul, Minneapolis, and other bishops that I've encountered, just, just, this is, my, this is my, just my experience, is I've never met a compromising bishop, I don't think, at least. I've only met faithful men who are saying, absolutely, we will do absolutely everything we can to eradicate and eliminate anyone who would abuse any dangers for our kids. So if the question is like, are you as angry as we are? Absolutely, I don't, yes, uh, B, the other question of, did you know about this? Is this like something that's going on underground that all priests know about? Like, absolutely not. Like, at least this priest, I, no idea. C, or, or three, I, I, I don't, I don't know if this is the time. I don't know, maybe it's not the time. But people are asking like, so hasn't the church done anything? Have we learned from the past? Haven't we learned from 2002? And I, th I don't know. I think the answer is yes. Here's what I mean. In 2002, when the stuff broke in Boston, like spotlight, the whole thing, right? The bishops met and they had the Dallas Charter. That charter put in really, really strict, uh, like zero tolerance, po tolerance policy for anyone who would be abusing. So it's that any kind of like shuffle it under the rug or, 
or uh, move the person around, like done, like absolutely not. Like this is gonna be something where if someone comes forward, we're gonna believe the, the, the victim, the one who's making the accusation, and the priest will be immediately suspended, and, and like all these steps are gonna be taken like without, without fail. And as far as I know, in all dioceses that I've been part of, that has happened. Now, another thing when it comes to that is, um, uh, like every diocese in the, in the country has what you call, I mean, we have to go through uh, training, like child protection training, all these kind of things. Like not just priests, deacons, not just uh, clergy, but also in parish employees and volunteers, anyone working with youth has to go through all this training. And one of the big pieces of training and one of the big like rules or laws, or whatever you want to call it, um, about working with youth, and that's what I do for my, that's my ministry, right? Is the cult thing, something called the too deep rule, where you may not, if you're an adult, you may not be alone with the youth. Too deep rule. You have to have at least one other adult or group of people, whatever the thing is. Like, you may not, and this is kind of the stuff, this is like the, the priest, this is the church that I have, was ordained into, right? Because I was ordained a deacon in 2002, right in the middle of this whole thing. And so it was, I remember, I remember going to, I remember when I got ordained and I, I, I we went out with my family, um, went, out with my, went out with my family to a restaurant, whatever, to like celebrate, I got ordained and this and that, and I remember getting up from the table to go uh, to the restroom, and I walked by these guys, about my age, you know, at the time, um, we're in, we're in this, you know, and I walked by and these two guys were like, huh, child molester. I remember thinking, oh, oh, so this is what this is going to be like. This is what it's going to be like to go out in public. And that's how it was. I mean, that's kind of what it's been. Uh, you know, you go to the grocery store, walk through the airport and moms have their kids and shift them over to the other side, like watching me, you know, like. I remember being really troubled by that, really bothered by that the first year. I mean, it always bothers me, whatever, but um, being really, really bothered by that. I remember going into the chapel going like, God, what the heck? I mean, I didn't do anything. Why, why is this, why do I have to deal with this? And I remember the Lord speaking and he was like, you know what? Those kids didn't do anything either. They, are, they didn't do anything wrong. But because of someone else, they have to carry this weight for the rest of their lives. And they didn't deserve it. So if you have to wear a collar and maybe some people look at you suspiciously, then you, you, you can bear that. Because those kids didn't deserve this. And they are experiencing far, far greater weight greater pain than you could ever experience by someone looking at you askew, you know? Here's the last thing. I know some people would say like, okay, so this is the church I'm in. I, I can't stay. I gotta leave. I get it. I understand. I kind of understand. I kind of understand because I'm like, I don't know, I've never, I never believed in a bishop and ever believed in a priest. Um, some of my, the priests I looked up to when I was a kid or growing up, coming of age, you know, uh, I failed in big ways. And so, like, I never, like, put my faith in, like, the priesthood or a certain priest or a certain bishop. And again, I've always kind of, I guess I've always known that the church is broken because I know that I'm broken and I know that I know it's the human condition. So I guess there's a piece of that. I don't get it. If Jesus founded the church, then why would I ever leave, even if it's got corruption? But I would invite you to do the same. Don't leave the church when things get tough. Lead the church when things get tough. I'll say that again. Here's what we do as body, the body of Christ, as Christians, as followers of Christ, as Catholics. We don't leave the church when it gets difficult, when there's bad things, when there's awful stuff. We lead the church when there are bad things, when there's corruption, when there's awful things. And the best way you and I can lead the church is by becoming saints. That's it. Like nothing short, nothing short of that is going to help anything. We have this policy, this Dallas charter, we have all these too deep rule. All those things are fine. Those are good. They protect kids. None of them are enough. None of them are enough. When the things get difficult and when you just like, you know, the thing gets peeled back and you're like, what? this is disgusting. Don't leave. Lead. 
and lead by saying, what is disgusting in my life? Where in my life do I compromise? Where in my life do I say, oh, that's fine, or this is fine, and stop it? Where in my life is there infidelity? Where in my life is there a two-facedness? Where in my life is there corruption? And weed it out, bring it into the light, refuse to compromise with it. And don't leave the church, brother and sister, listening to me right now, don't leave the church, lead the church. The church needs you to lead it by being a saint more than ever. Maybe, maybe we needed it in the last 100 years too, absolutely. Maybe we needed it in the last 2,000 years, that's true. But right now, it is unmistakably clear that what the church needs more than, again, another charter, more than more rules, what the church needs is people who are willing to be uncompromising with themselves in their pursuit of Jesus, to be courageous, to be faithful, to become holy, and to lead the church by becoming the saints that the church needs right now. Again, please, don't leave. Lead. From all of us here at Ascension Presents, my name is Father Mike. God bless.